Hey everyone, welcome to Classic Cinema. The United States was deeply entrenched in World War II by 1943, bringing about a period of challenge, change, and uncertainty to the film industry. The Hollywood of that era was very different than today, but they never lost sight of their role in the war effort. The film industry made many social and cinematic achievements in both fiction and nonfiction films. But Hollywood came of age during the war, with movie going becoming a unifying ritual for millions of Americans at home or overseas. I feel that it was the movie industry's finest hour at not only uniting our country during this trying time, but also showing all the folks at home what our boys were going through all around the world. Some of the best movies that year were Shadow of a Doubt. Faded, fat, greedy women. They're alive, they're human beings. Are they? The Oxbow Incident. You got any doubts, Teddy? I say let's call off this party. This is only slightly any of your business, my friend. Remember that? Hangin's any man's business that's around. For whom the bell tolls. <laughs> and the song of Bernadette. All great films, of course, but we are going to look at what I think are the 10 most underrated films from 1943 today. So without further ado. Coming in at number 10 is an American spy thriller directed by Norman Foster. Based on the 1940 book of the same name by Eric Ambler, Journey into Fear stars Joseph Cotton, Dolores Del Rio, Agnes Moorhead, Ruth Warwick, and... Orson Welles. Cotton co-wrote the screenplay with Welles, and even though others were credited with the making of this film, you can see Welles' fingerprints all over it. The plot of Journey into Fear has Joseph Cotton playing Howard Graham, an American engineer in Istanbul trying to upgrade the Turkish Navy. He becomes the target of a Nazi assassin and escapes his hotel to board a ship with the aid of Colonel Hockey, Wells' character, leaving behind his wife, Ruth Warwick, in the process. Graham interacts with many passengers on the ship, including a sultry dancer, Josette Martel, Del Rio's character. But one mysterious passenger, Peter Bonat, played by Jack Moss, is the one Graham cannot quite figure out. Journey into Fear is a thrilling spy film that takes place during actual wartime with lots of unique dark overtones. Wells did direct some scenes, adding his touch to this haunting, atmospheric movie. The film feels like a precursor to Wells' film, The Third Man. The plot can be a tad confusing, and the editing leaves something to be desired in this short 68-minute film. How long do you stay here, Mr. Graham? Well, he leaves tomorrow, too. Yes, I'm leaving on the morning train. I'm going as far as Batumi by boat. Foster's goal, or maybe it was Wells, was to try to show how fear can make a regular person heroic. It's an interesting Norwich film with exotic locations, politics, humor, Espionage, moody atmosphere, sexy babes, philosophy, creepy villains, and wisdom. That being said, Journey into Fear is a flawed, but fun film. Sneaking in at number 9 today is Above Suspicion, an American wartime spy drama directed by Richard Thorpe. This movie stars Fred McMurray, Joan Crawford, Conrad Veidt, and Basil Rathbone. This was Crawford's last film with MGM after 18 years. She signed with Warner Brothers shortly after. This movie was also Veidt's last role. He died of a heart attack after filming. He is best remembered as Major Strasse in Casablanca. The story begins before World War II as newlyweds professor Richard Miles, played by McMurray, and Francis, Crawford's character, get ready to leave England for their honeymoon in Germany. But their plans are changed when they are enticed by the British Secret Service to find a Nazi scientist determined to destroy the British Navy. Above Suspicion is a well-paced and entertaining film, 
but not near as suspenseful as similar Hitchcock films. It can seem silly and lighthearted at times. Richard to do it because, well, he, he's an ordinary chap and an American, and he's been climbing in the Tyrol for the past eight years regularly. I'm sure he won't attract undue attention or be interfered with. Oh, I see. Typical tourist, above suspicion. The film kind of reminds me of the Thin Man series, and McMurray and Crawford have great chemistry together. There are a lot of quick-witted lines and anti-German insults. The main characters exude a, <laughs> these crazy Germans are at it again, attitude. Rathbone is very convincing as the villainous Sigurd von Oschhausen. He can be a charming gentleman in one scene and ruthless in another. I think he would have made a perfect James Bond villain as an actor. Veidt took a break from playing a villain with his role as Hassert Seidel, who is a member of the Underground Resistance. Above suspicion is pure escapism, so enjoyed for what it is. I was particularly delighted by the ending, which was a bit jarring. After successfully evading capture by the Nazis as they escaped to Italy, McMurray quips lightheartedly, How about some spaghetti? Not so much a spy drama as a noir psychological thriller, my number eight film is The Fallen Sparrow. Directed by Richard Wallace, this film was based on the novel of the same name by Dorothy B. Hughes. Sparrow stars John Garfield, Maureen O'Hara, Walter Slezak, Patricia Morrison, and Hugh Beaumont. Starring Barbara Billingsley. Hugh Beaumont. The Fallen Sparrow begins when John Kit McKittrick, played by Garfield, returns to New York after being released from a Spanish prison for fighting in the Spanish Civil War. His New York cop friend that sprang him from prison is believed to have committed suicide, but McKittrick calls BS. While investigating his friend's death, Kit crosses paths with three beautiful dames, one of whom is tied to his past. McKittrick finds out about the death of another friend while the Nazis are closing in, including the dangerous Dr. Skoss, Slezak's character. We're not good for each other, kid. Aren't we? No, there are many reasons, but I'd like you to believe in me. Although he was under contract by Warner Brothers, Garfield was traded to RKO for the picture. O'Hara is absolutely gorgeous in this movie, even if it is in black and white. She was a surprising choice for the femme fatale role, but she shows off her versatility. This film opened up her career, giving her a chance to choose better roles. Walter Slezak is menacing as the sleazy villain Dr. Skoss. I was just frightening these people. I was comparing modern scientific torture with the methods of the ancients. Shall I continue? Even though the plot is vague and hard to follow, Garfield's intense and troubled veteran is a joy to watch as he fights for his life against the vicious Nazis. Although The Fallen Sparrow was made as a vehicle to promote O'Hara, it's Garfield that steals the show. I don't expect to find anything more than Louis did, but I know the man that limps will come along, and when I meet him, I'm going to kill him. Roy Webb's score and Nicholas Musaraka's cinematography add depth to the mood and tension. If you like bleak, suspenseful thrillers, I urge you to try out The Fallen Sparrow, if only to witness Garfield's convincing powerhouse performance. Northern Pursuit races in at number seven. Directed by Raoul Walsh, this film is a wartime thriller set in Canada. It stars Errol Flynn, Julie Bishop, Helmut Dantin, and John Ridgely. Errol Flynn plays Mountie Corporal Wagner, who joins his fiancée Laura, Bishop's character, as they lure Nazi spy Colonel Von Keller, played by Dantine, and his Nazi cohorts into a trap. Although it's not one of Flynn's best, it's still an entertaining watch, even though it was intended to be a wartime propaganda film. Wagner, tell him I'm loyal. You wanted me to help you, but I wouldn't. You remember. Tell him I'm loyal. Ask him. Ask him. He tried to get me to help him, but I wouldn't. Wagner, hurry up. Get going. You miss. We're moving. Sandra, bring the dogs. Warner Brothers got a lot of free publicity due to Flynn being involved in a real-life grape trial, giving the outdoor adventure a huge box office boost. 
Flynn plays the faithful fiancé, telling his woman Laura she's the only woman he loves, then turns away breathing, what am I saying? I'm sure they got a lot of snickers in the theaters at that time. Walsh handles the action scenes with his typical flair and his love of focus is apparent as in his earlier films such as The Big Trail, High Sierra, and The Roaring Twenties. What do you mean by bringing him up here? As long as he works with us, we're all right. Let him think we're stupid. That a man who would take a chance like he has taken so far is not afraid to die. Walsh gives us many close-ups, shots that zoom in on the actors' faces that reveal their thoughts better than words. Northern Pursuit also delves into the treatment of Canadians of German descent in a balanced but complex way instead of just open prejudice. All the supporting players, Bishop, Ridgely, Lockhart, and Tully, turn in fine performances. Probably leading you into a trap. I can take care of myself. You forget we have an organization, Corporal. You've always had a tendency to forget that very simple fact. I'm forgetting nothing. Dantine delivers a nuanced turn as Von Keller, not just a typical Nazi fanatic. If you're an Errol Flynn fan, Northern Pursuit is an enjoyable black and white good versus evil movie with beautifully filmed wintry landscapes. Clarence Brown directed the number six movie today, which is called The Human Comedy, an American comedy drama based on a screenplay written by William Soroyan, who was also scheduled to direct. Soroyan was replaced, so he wrote a novel of the same name and published it before the release of the film. It's all in the family anyway. My brother's in the army. Yeah, what outfit's he with? Field artillery. Marcus McCauley, private first class. Here. Here's a picture of him. Big brother, huh? Yeah. Where's he stationed? Green River, North Carolina. The film stars Mickey Rooney, Frank Morgan, Van Johnson, Donna Reed, Robert Mitchum, and Barry Nelson. The plot of the human comedy centers around 14-year-old Homer McCauley, played by Rooney, who wants to be the fastest telegraph messenger in the West. Being the man of the house now since his father died two years ago and his older brother is off to war, Homer comes face to face with real-life circumstances as he delivers messages of wartime love, death, and money in the fictional town of Ithaca, California during World War II. War Department. War Department. It says that your son is dead, Mrs. Sandoval. The human comedy might remind you of a sappy Frank Capra drama, but it's done well. Rooney also delivers one of his best performances. Brown does an admirable job of setting the mood of small town America during the war. He reminds you of the time when people were decent and cared about their community and country, and you could leave your doors unlocked. The film won an Oscar for Best Story, and Rooney was nominated for Best Actor. The Human Comedy also received nominations for Best Director, Best Picture, and Best Cinematography. Mrs. Kate McCauley, the War Department regrets to inform you that your son... Marcus. You might recognize Carl Switzer, better known as Alfalfa from Our Gang Show, or The Little Rascals, who plays the leader of a neighborhood gang. The human comedy seems like a glimpse of an America that had no longer exist and the innocence of days gone by. And I'm not going to lie, the ending choked me up a bit. The human comedy might seem corny today, but I think of it as a piece of good old-fashioned Americana with a healthy dose of patriotism. Creeping in at number five on the list is Edge of Darkness, a powerful World War II drama directed by Lewis Milestone, who helmed such classics as All Quiet on the Western Front, Of Mice and Men, Ocean's Eleven, and Mutiny on the Bounty. The film stars Errol Flynn, Ann Sheridan, Walter Houston, John Houston's father, Ruth Gordon, and Helmut Dantin. In Edge of Darkness, Norwegian villagers prepare for a revolt against their Nazi invaders. Karen, if we're going to fight, we have to be like steel. Yes, Gunnar. 
With the help of British forces, the fisherman Gunnar, Flynn's character, his fiancée Karen, played by Sheridan, and her father, Dr. Martin Stensgard, Houston's character, lead the local resistance. Unfortunately, Karen's brother Johan, a known Nazi sympathizer, shows up before the revolt and she must choose between her family or her town. This film was based on the novel of the same name by William Woods. Humphrey Bogart was originally cast as Gunner, but dropped out and was replaced by Flynn. Your peace. What peace is there when a body of troops can come in the middle of the night and arrest you as a hostage to be shot? Something you never did or never even thought of. Edge of Darkness is a very tense, gritty, and emotional story about the occupation of Norway with masterful direction and superb acting. Flynn's Gonar is not his typical elegant, light-hearted rogue that jokes around with beating the bad guys. He gets down and dirty here. Milestone said about Flynn after filming, quote, Flynn kept underrating himself. If you wanted to embarrass him, all you had to do was to tell him how great he was in a scene he'd just finished. He'd blush like a girl muttering, I'm not an actor, and go sit in a corner, unquote. I think this dark and grim war film has been unjustly neglected and has a powerful message. The Constant Nymph glides in at number four on my list. A romantic drama directed by Edmund Golding, this film stars Charles Boyer, Joan Fontaine, Alexis Smith, Brenda Marshall, Charles Coburn, and Peter Lorre. Eric Wolfgang Korngold composed the movie's fantastic score. Fontaine was nominated for Best Actress and said this film was her favorite. A beautiful woman gets off the train and a poor musician wants to take her into his arms and kiss her. And they lived happily ever after. They could. In The Constant Nymph, Charles Boyer plays Belgian composer Louis Dodd who meets the daughter of his mentor, Tessa Sanger, played by Fontaine, and she falls in love with him. When Tessa's father dies, her uncle and his daughter, Florence, played by Smith, visit their relatives, igniting a romance between Florence and Dodd. They eventually get married, crushing Tessa's hopes and creating a heated rivalry between the cousins as a love triangle develops. The entire cast gives memorable performances. You must be protected. Protected? Yes. But my heart's a very simple heart, isn't that some protection? In spite of all the melodrama, at its base level, The Constant Nymph is the tragic story of a wayward musician searching for inspiration in the form of a muse. Some of the downsides are spotty direction and the story drags at times. Also, some of it just feels fake and the runtime feels like it could have been shortened. The great Peter Lorre seems wasted here, playing an ordinary Joe. And, and don't go getting fond of any unnecessary people. You can be as fond of us as you like, but, oh, but please don't, don't. Don't what? Well, don't go getting married or, or in jail or, or, or die or anything, please. But overall, this tearjerker is handled with care, wit, and intelligence. No, I don't think he knows now, but one day he'll look at me and he'll say, Darling, darling, Tessa, and everything will be all right. The Constant Nymph is a film about something everyone can relate to, the loss of love. My next film at number three was nominated for Best Picture that year. Watch on the Rhine was directed by Herman Shumlin with a screenplay by famed author Dashiell Hammett. This film stars Paul Lucas, who won an Oscar for Best Actor, Betty Davis, Lucille Watson, Geraldine Fitzgerald, and George Kalouris. The story has Lucas playing Kurt Mueller, an anti-fascist German engineer with an American wife, Sarah, Davis's character, who along with their three children, returned to the U.S. in 1940 after living in Europe for 17 years. While there, Kurt was involved in the Nazi underground resistance. A house guest of Sarah's family in Washington, D.C., deceitful Romanian Count Tech D. Brankovis, played by Kalouris, finds out about Kurt's secret and blackmails him. There's no money missing. The case has been examined. The gun was put back in a different place. 
Despite this being a grim movie, it was a critical and commercial success upon release. Hammett crafted an intelligent and highly effective screenplay based on the play by Lillian Hellman, probably one of the best of the 1940s wartime movies. Lucas was very convincing as Mueller, as was Kalouris as the conniving Count. Lucas portrayed a quiet, yet determined courage to fight against a tyrant plaguing his country. You have to keep in mind this is not a spy thriller with twists and turns. This film is a drama piece to promote people to stand against fascism, but it does have its tense moments. Davis, as usual, gives an inspired performance as Sarah. Her speech in the final scene is done so well it doesn't seem scripted. I'm sure every mother and wife in America could relate. I don't like to be alone at night. I guess everybody in the world's got a time they don't like. Me, it's right before I go to sleep. Now it's going to be for always. All the rest of my life. Watch on the Rhine seems to be a forgotten classic one that should be on your watch list if you are an aficionado of World War II films. Diving in at number two on the list is a riveting World War II aviation film produced by Hal B. Wallace and Jack Warner and directed by the talented Howard Hawks. Air Force stars John Garfield, John Ridgely, Gig Young, Arthur Kennedy, and Harry Carey. Air Force's story centers on an actual event that happened on December 7, 1941, the day of the Pearl Harbor attack. Garfield, Kennedy, and George Tobias are the crew on the Mary Ann, a Boeing B-17 Flying Fortress bomber on a training flight from California to Hawaii. They get a first-person view of the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, but can't do anything in their unarmed bomber. After the United States joins the war, their crew tries to defend the Philippines and are constantly under attack by the enemy. In six hours, you better be five and a half hours out of here. With the beacons we've got, the Japs don't have to wait for daylight to come calling. Air Force was planned to be released on December 7, 1942 on the one-year anniversary of the original attack. Due to delays, it wasn't released until March 1943. The film won an Oscar for Best Film Editing and was also nominated for Best Writing, Best Special Effects, and Best Cinematography. I will say Air Force does have some dull parts and the plot is stretched thin, making it seem sluggish at times. Ridgely plays Irish, the commander of the Marianne, who has an emotional deathbed scene written by none other than William Faulkner, who was uncredited. Here, sir. Okay. Start him, Bill. Sure, Irish. Everybody in, Chief? All in, sir. Hawks lends his expert touch in regards to the men, who must pull together as a team showing confidence and professionalism during a crisis. This film has lots of death and brutal destruction as Hawks pulled no punches. Air Force's action scenes and banter gave inspiration to George Lucas for his Star Wars movies. There are a lot of similarities between gun turrets on the Mary Ann and the Millennium Falcon. Although some people thought of it as wartime propaganda, it is a fascinating and sometimes thrilling portrayal of wartime events. It's a classic World War II era film that while not entirely historically accurate, it certainly feels like it. For war movie lovers, Air Force is entertaining and a must-see. Coming in as the top film on my list is one of my personal favorites and directed by Jacques Tournier, the horror film The Leopard Man. This film is based on the book Black Alibi by author Cornell Woolrich. The film stars Dennis O'Keefe, Jean Brooks, Margot, and Marguerite Silva. When Latin dancer Clo-Clo, played by Margot, starts to upstage singer Kiki Walker, Brooks' character, in steps Jerry Manning, played by O'Keefe, who is Kiki's agent. He believes he can kick up Kiki's act a notch by having her perform with a black leopard on a leash. The leopard escapes, and not long after, a girl is found dead 
along with others in the small town. After some investigation, many begin to believe the killer is human, making the Leopard's owner Charlie, played by Abner Bieberman, the prime suspect. As a fan of serial killer movies, The Leopard Man is one of the first American films to try to make a realistic portrayal before the term serial killer was even invented. Tourneur's direction is wonderful, making the movie suspenseful and atmospheric. He does an expert job of using shadows and sound to build tension. It has a smart, tight script that moves quickly. To me, it just gets better with age. In history, there must have been men like that. Men with kinks in their brains. Yes, there have been men who killed for pleasure. Strange pleasure. There was Bluebeard in France, Jack the Ripper in London. It's not uncommon. The Leopard Man had mixed reviews when released, but has grown in popularity over the years. It has become a cult classic and is considered one of the best horror movies. One of the scenes that has really stuck with me is the murder of the young girl outside the door to her home. You never see it, but you hear her blood-curdling screams and see the blood pooling under the door, leaving it all to your imagination. Absolutely terrifying. Turnier collaborated with producer Val Luton of RKO to make two other B-movie classics, Cat People and I Walked with a Zombie. He enjoyed focusing on what lurked in the shadows. In one scene, you don't see the leopard, but you can feel his presence in a dark alleyway with a swaying tree branch. Besides shadows, Turnier makes an effective use of sound to scare you and for suspense. A train making a constant racket, dripping water inside a tunnel, and clo-close castanets. There are a few faults. Some corny dialogue, one-dimensional characters, and a too tidy ending, but it's still a great little hair razor and deserves to be a horror masterpiece. Thanks for watching everyone. If you enjoyed the video, click the like button. Also, if you subscribe, click the little bell icon for notifications. I'd love to read your comments and have you share the video with your friends. I'd appreciate everyone's help in keeping this channel growing. Until next time, adios amigos.